All right, gang, check it out. Check it out as promised. I got Tom and Freddie on the line here from American Mafia. Guys, how you doing? Great. Doing great. Yeah, awesome. Great, great awesome. to be having us on the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys for taking the time to uh, call in tonight and chat, chatting with us for a bit. But, uh, we appreciate it. So, guys, tell, tell us, uh, give us a little history on American Mafia, man. Uh, when, did, when did it all start? Tom, Tom, do you want to get the rundown or you want me to do it? Go ahead. You, yeah, you, you're very good at it, Freddie. So, <laughs> I've done it so many times at this point. <laughs> uh, so years ago, years ago, Tom and I had a band called Holy Water. This was going back to like the late 80s, early 90s. And um, we were in the studio doing demos with Al Greenwood from Farner producing. And uh, we were on sort of like a informal developmental deal with Jason Slum from Atlantic Records. And um, the type of music that we were doing was we had a singer by the name of Dave Knight who sounded a lot like Lou Graham. And, you know, Al was interested. I was playing keyboards on it as well as producing. So there was a lot of interest there in terms of it being an AOR type of project. Um, while we were in the studio doing that record, though, uh, Nirvana's album came out, Nevermind, and it kind of turned the music world on its head. Mm-hmm. And... Nobody was interested in bands like us anymore. So that kind of ended that whole project for us. Um, but then fast forward to about, you know, 10 years later or so, 2001 or mid 2000s. And, you know, there was this whole resurgence for, um, you know, melodic rock or classic rock type stuff that was happening in Europe. And so, you know, Tom and I had been, you know, we've been friends for a long time, even if we haven't been in direct contact. But I got back in touch with Tom, and we talked about maybe properly recording all of the material that never got finished back then and trying to find an outlet for it. And um, so we started to do that uh, with a different drummer, <clears throat> with the drummer that we have now, Bobby Marks. And we couldn't get a hold of Dave at the time. Nobody knew where he was. This was before... We started this before Facebook, so we didn't have the the, uh, the privilege of having that at our disposal to track somebody down. But eventually Dave resurfaced, but he wasn't so into really doing what we were doing anymore. He kind of moved into a more uh, pop-oriented style of music. So uh, when Dave bailed out of the project, we decided to change the name from Holy Water to something else. Um and it was kind of hard because we weren't a functioning band. It was hard to find one singer to commit to the entire record. So we decided to have different singers sing different songs. And while we were trying to come up with a name, one of the things we discussed was coming up with a name that had sort of like a um, a, a group or a gang mentality. Or right. And, um, and, you know, American Mafia is, not an uncommon term, you know, it's something that people were familiar with. So um, we thought that might help kind of uh, bring about some awareness to the band. Uh, and I, yeah, so that's kind of, kind of, you know, the condensed version of how that, how that happened. Unfortunately, Dave is no longer with us. He, he, um, he passed away a couple of years ago and, um, you know, uh, is missed, you know, but, um, you know, we decided to move on and, you know, do these songs anyway without him. So, um, you know, hopefully, you know, we did them as much justice as he would have had he still been on the planet. But um, I think everybody that, came, that you know, participated in the project did a great job singing-wise. So we're really happy with the end result. Cool, cool. Very cool. And, and, and uh, you know, sorry for your loss, guys. Yeah, um, thank you. He Jeez. had some personal problems, I guess, that never really um, were, you know, I was never made aware of the details of what was going on in his life. So he left the project before he passed away, but, um, you know, and he gave us his blessing to continue, which, uh, you know, was great to have that. And, um, you know, so, but the details surrounding his death is sort of somewhat mysterious, but he obviously had some personal issues in his life that 
nobody really knew about. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just unfortunate. You know, I mean, not only the fact that he was a talented guy and it's just kind of a waste of a guy with a really gifted voice. We kept two of his songs on the record, uh, All I Need, which is the ballad, and Living for the City, which is the Stevie Wonder cover. So if you're, any of your listeners are curious, Dave sings those two songs. Um, but, you know, he was just a really sweet human being, too. He was a really nice guy. Yeah, he's, he's like the nicest guy you, you could ever meet. Super nice guy, incredible talent, amazing voice. We were lucky to work with him. Wow, wow. So, you know, and it's, you know, never, never easy having to go through something like that. But it was, uh, you know, it was great that you got his blessing to uh, continue on with the project. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I mean, I guess we could have abandoned it, too. You know, I mean, it was kind of daunting to think about replacing Dave because he was such a good singer. But, you know, we just put on our thinking caps and made a list of people that we, you know, thought we might want to work with, you know, the dream list. (laughs) And then, uh, you know, uh, kind of went from there, you know, and worked off a list of guys that we thought we might, you know, like to have sing on it. And, you know, some guys turned us down for whatever reason, you know, they were either too busy or, you know, had too much on their plate or, you know, were involved in another band who was having a record come out that they didn't want to compromise the, you know, the PR for that. Um, Or they just didn't really know enough about the project to kind of commit to it, you know, so, um, you know, but it just seems like, you know, Tom and I laugh about this all the time because, we seem to have just really lucked out with the guys that ended up singing on it because, you know, we couldn't have, you know, done a better job had we really tried. It just seems like we picked the right guys to sing the right songs and they knocked, every everybody knocked it out of the park in terms of their, you know, because we let them write their own lyrics and melodies and stuff. We didn't give them any, any um, there were no restraints in that regard in terms of what we wanted. We said, here's the music, you know, we gave them free rent and we couldn't yeah, be just happy. Do what you, just do what you think you know, was appropriate. And everybody really did what was ideally appropriate without much instruction from our end. Wow. So we got really lucky in that regard. Yeah, and that's uh, that's uh, really cool because um, it sounds like uh, Tom and Freddie, you guys are the core members of the band. And um, yes. yeah, usually it's the core members that'll write, that'll do all the songwriting, lyrics, music, and then they'll bring other people in and say, hey, this is what I want. But for you guys to give them the freedom to do, to do that, 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 that's awesome, man. That's above and beyond. That's, that's great. Yeah, we learn that that's what brings out the best in the song. So like, it, it's all about feeling. Music's all about feeling, at least from my point of view. And um, each, each guy felt it his own way. You know, we, we didn't tell anybody what to do. Yeah. And uh, like Freddie said, they knocked it out of the park. Yeah. <laughs> Each and every one. I, I should give Don, Don Chapman, who sings on Friendly Fire and, um, and Death and Satisfaction, I, I should give him a little bit of credit for this, too, because what happened was, you know, all these songs were written with Dave singing. Like, Dave had lyrics and melodies for all these songs, and they were different titles and different lyrics and different melodies. And... Don, the first song anybody did outside of Dave was Don Chaffin sang Friendly Fire. That was the first song to get done. And I actually gave Don um, the working demo that, I guess you could call it a demo. It wasn't really a, a studio production demo. It was kind of like a live recording of us playing the song in, in the original drummer's basement with Dave singing. So it had his lyrics and melodies. And I gave that to Don to work off of. And Don came to me and said, you know, would you guys mind if I just really tried my own thing with this? I, I, I really think I can, can come up with something that you guys will dig. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time singing other people's stuff throughout my career. And I really feel like I can, can do this justice. And, you know, I, I talked to Tom and I said, yeah, why not? You know, let him do his own thing. See what, see what he comes up with. So Don kind of started that. And then after he gave us Friendly Fire, we were like, all right, well, we may as well let, you know, everybody come up with their own stuff. I mean, because the worst case scenario was if they didn't come up with anything good, we always had Dave's lyrics and melodies to fall back on. But and, uh, at the end of the day, we didn't need them. 
you know, so. <laughs> That's really Well, as, as great as Dave was, and, and the, as great as the songs were, I, I think that, uh, you know, we, we did not do them an in, injustice by uh, letting these guys have free reign, because they really did, uh, in my opinion, I think, you know, the songs came out great. They really did a good yeah. job. Awesome, guys. Awesome. So how would you guys describe your sound to people? Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> I don't want to say it. I don't want to, say it. I don't want to put us in a... In a genre? In a, it, well, not as... Not, well, the genre... Well, okay, it's hard rock. That's the genre. But, uh, yeah, I was going to say uh, retro 70s. However, it's, you know, the new stuff that we have now, it's kind of like going to turn the page... And um, a little bit, at least, um, with some of the songs. So, you know, we're, we're going to broaden our horizons a little bit. I mean, we, Freddie and I both have so much history and, um, you know, different bands we played in. And uh, we have a large category of, of, of riffs that we can, uh, we can, bring, we can bring about any <laughs> either 80s or 70s out of them or, you know, or, or go in uncharted territories with them. So um, it's, it's, it's going to be hard rock. <laughs> That's what I can say. Cool. Cool. Well, you know, uh, you know, I'm coming across this more often where um, uh, bands, uh, you know, I, older guys, not the kids, but the older guys are, are uh, reaching back to their roots and, and touching on music from, from the, the, their era. Um, is, that, is that something you guys are would you say? Well, I don't know if it. Yeah, I don't know if it happens intentionally, but it certainly happens just because those are our influences. You know, I mean, I grew up on Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and you know bands like that. So you know, Free and Humble Pie and Bad Company and you know. And when I was even younger, I mean, you know, I, it, you know, when I was younger, it was Dio and Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and you know, Deep Purple and stuff like that. But then, you know, as I got a little older, it was more Led Zeppelin, Humble Pie, Bad Company, Free, and stuff like that. So, you know, those influences can't help but seep through, you know? I mean, they're there. It, even if you don't, you know, you know, somehow, some way they're going to, you know, rear their head, you know, through, you know, the lens of your own personality, you know? So mm-hmm. hopefully we're not too derivative, you know, but... Um, you know, because it certainly isn't intentional, but, you know, you reap what no, that's what, you that's what the risks, all the risks and ideas are born from that. So, you know, I, I can say personally, I never, I never tried to write a song like anybody, you know, but, you know, whether it's uh, subliminal or not, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, your roots are going to, are going to show somehow. Right, you know? right. So, I mean, these, I mean, these tunes are you guys. Is, is, is your your experience, your your influences? I mean, the, this this is you guys. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, well, guys, um, uh, the first song I want to play tonight, man, uh, your good loving. What can you guys tell us about the tune? Well, um. I don't know. John West was maybe like the third singer that we brought in or something and uh, second or third, maybe. I I just remember hearing his vocal track on this song and it really, you know, it really elevated the whole prospect of what we were doing. Because again, it was somebody that, you know, I was familiar with John through, you know, his work with, he's played with a bunch of different bands, Badlands and Lynch Mob and, um, Royal Hunt and Our Tension and, uh, you know, but, you know, he's kind of been known mostly in the progressive metal world. And I think, you know, when I got this song from, from him, uh, I didn't really know what to expect, you know, because it's a, it's really a blues, bluesy rock kind of tune. And, um, you know, I mean, I was just blown away personally by his performance because it wasn't like anything I'd ever heard from him before personally. I mean, maybe other people have heard him do that kind of style stuff, but I really thought, um, you know, we we tapped into something that was in his wheelhouse vocally. Um, 
and, and at the end of the day, you know, the songs that Tom and I put together for this record, I, you know, they really weren't about, you know, I mean, Tom and I could have made a, a record of, you know, flashy guitar chops and bass chops and stuff, but the songs were really about songs, you know, really creating something for great singers to sing their asses off over, you know, and they and that's what they did. You know, so, I'm, you know... Um, I think that John really was, I think he was the first singer that sang to that song. Did we didn't we never had any other vocals on that on that song, Freddie, did we? Yeah, Dave Dave. It was called Basics of Love, remember? Uh, <laughs> see? John did such a great <laughs> job with it. He did such a great job with it that I forgot what Dave did. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's true. However, yeah, American Mafia is all about the songs. All about the songs. Awesome. All right, listeners, check it out. This is Your Good Loving from American Mafia. We'll be right back.
right, gang. We got Freddie and Tom from American Mafia still with us, guys. How's it going? Great. I'm great. Awesome tune, guys. Thanks for having us again. Yeah, yeah, thank you, man. Yeah. Awesome tune. Digging it. Greatly I know appreciate the it. listeners are digging it. Uh, guys, um, I guess, Tom, we can start with you, man. When did you first pick up your instrument, man? When did you know this is what you wanted to do? <laughs> it was, it's been a long time, long time. Um, probably when I was in... In high school, actually, it was when I was uh, when I first got into playing. It was a while back. Um, however, I had an old I have an older brother, and uh, he turned me on to um, two albums. I remember um, clearly it was uh, Tarkus from Miss Lincoln Palmer, mm-hmm. and the other album was uh, Black Sabbath, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath. So I, you know I. And also went and then took it Sleigh Ride Mountain. Um, so those were the three albums that, that I was turned on to for my brother that could be considered, you know, hard rock, maybe heavy metal, I guess. Like, well, and, uh, Sabbath is like the godfathers I mean, of metal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I really dug, you know, I dug the guitar playing. And, um, and you know, then Ze- Zeppelin came into the picture for me. And... Um, that was my influence, basically, to, to get you know my my inspiration to learn how to play. So um, after that, you know, it 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 changed through the years. You know, I got, I, I was turned on to Ted Nugent. I go, I went to see Sabbath at uh, at um, Madison Square Garden, and um, Ted Nugent was opening for them, and I was turned on to Ted Nugent. I didn't know who he was. I was blown away by him. And uh, he was a very big inspiration on me as well. Cool. And um, and then again through the years, you know, I, I was turned on to different. I, I was turned on to UFO, and um, you know, Van Halen came out UFO. So Michael Schenker is a really big, big influence on me, as well as, as Eddie Van Halen. And uh, so, so those, those were my inspirations to to want to learn how to play and. And I stuck to it and um, learned by ear. <laughs> you know, I taught myself how to play. Hey, cool, so that's man, what, cool. you know, what I told you before. It, you know, for, for me, it's all about feeling. You know what I mean? It's right. all about feeling. Freddie, man, how about you? Um, yeah, well, I started out as a drummer when I was a kid. I was because, like a lot of kids, I was really into Kiss and wanted to be like Peter Chris and stuff. And then I'm the youngest of... Uh, four siblings, so I have, you know, an older brother and two older sisters. One of my sisters was dating a guy who saw that I was into Kiss, and um, he came over with two Black Sabbath records one day, Sabotage and uh, Heaven and Hell. <laughs> and uh, and, I, and I, after hearing those two records, for whatever reason, I can't remember specifically why, but I asked my parents about if they could help me get a bass guitar, you know, because I was just mesmerized by Giza Butler's playing on those two records. And uh, so that's kind of what started it. You know, and then I got into, you know, Iron Maiden, obviously. Was, Iron Maiden, actually, that same guy took me to my first concert, which was Iron Maiden. So then it was Steve Harris, you oh, know. Like, so, yeah. So then at um, a place called North Stage Theater in um, Glen Cove on Long Island with the Rods opening up. Band. Oh, Carl <laughs> Kennedy, yeah. Yeah. Um, he lives down in your neck of the woods. Yeah, yep. But, yeah, so so actually, technically, the first band I ever saw live was The Rock. Oh, cool, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Real cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, so, so, and then from there, you know, I mean, I got into, you know, I, I actually went to music school. I went to Musicians Institute in California for a year. Um, like 90 to 91 and that really kind of opened up my ears to um you know players outside of heavy metal guys like james jameson who played on all the motown stuff and, you know because like 
as you get influenced by guys, you know, like at the time I was influenced by John Paul Jones, but then you learn that, okay, John Paul Jones was really influenced by James Jamerson from Motown. So you kind of follow the breadcrumb trail back to, you know, the, the, the initial catalyst for some of these guys that you get influenced by. And it's, it's, it becomes a really fascinating journey because, you know, all of that, you know, like we were talking about, you know, the sound of the music in terms of songwriting, you know, all of that trickles into it somehow at some point. Right, right. And, you know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, I often, often thought like the kids today, they might not know who uh, Led Zeppelin is, Pink Floyd or UFO, but I'm sure in one way or another they're they're influenced by them. Just because well, they have to be. Because you wouldn't have you wouldn't have some of the you know. I mean, if you look, you know, like take rival sons, you know, who are, who are new, you know, band of the moment um, that Tom and I just saw open for Black Sabbath. <clears throat> I mean, you wouldn't have a band like Rival Sons if it wasn't for Led Zeppelin, right? You know, and you wouldn't have Led Zeppelin if it wasn't for the Yardbirds. You know, and you probably wouldn't have the Yardbirds if it wasn't for you know, I don't know, Elvis Presley. You know, so it, it's just all kind of you know, there's. Definitely a, a lineage there that you can trace back for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, um, you know, you, you spoke of your influence. You know, the early seventies, you know, some sixties, early eighties. Uh, but who who would you guys say are your biggest musical influences, man? Tom. Biggest influences. Again. Um, you know, I think uh, for me, Ted Nugent, UFO, Michael Schenker group, um, I, I had the Judas Priest copy band. Priest was a big influence on me. We also played Maiden. Um, you know, all, all the hard rock bands. There's just so many. Rick Berenger, so many. I couldn't couldn't really name one. However, I, I would say right off the top of my head, Ted Nugent was a really big influence on me, and Michael Schenker was a huge influence on me. Awesome, awesome. What about what about you, Freddie? Yeah, well, I mean, about individual players, you know, uh, like I said, Geezer Butler from Black Side, John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin, Steve Harris from Iron Maiden. Um, you know, now I nowadays I freelance write for a couple of music magazines, Bass Player Magazine and Premier Guitar, so. I'm fortunate enough to get exposed to a lot of guys that I probably wouldn't normally have, uh, wouldn't normally be on my radar. Like I recently interviewed um, um, Esperanza Spalding, who's a jazz bassist, and she has a new record out that is just phenomenal. You know, and uh, you know, although I was aware of her. You know, I wasn't really all that familiar with her music, you know, but I had to get up to speed on some stuff for this interview. And, um, you know, I'm really grateful for that opportunity. And I expressed that to the publisher recently because her new record really just knocked my socks off. So, you know, it, it just really, you know, it ebbs and flows. You know, I'll go for periods without listening to any Black Sabbath, you know, and listen to, you know, other stuff, you know, to just try to, broaden my palette, my, you know, my musical palette a little bit. Yeah. You know, and if I'm working on music, you know, like kind of right now, Tom and I are working on this EP, you know, so in a way, <clears throat> that sort of becomes my biggest influence because I'm constantly listening to that over and over, you know, because, you know, as you're writing and recording songs, you know, you're you're refining and tweaking things and stuff. And, you know, so, so I'm mostly listening to that material just to get a sense of where it wants to live, you know, and try to try to be a good, you know, steward, you know, or shepherd for that process. Right, right. Um, I don't want to say I'm influenced by myself, but there is, there is a little bit of that where, you know, the, the project that you're working on takes precedence over listening to anything else. You know, because you, you also don't want to compare yourself and feel like, oh, man, I don't... <laughs> I don't sound as good as those guys, you know. You don't want to get it. You don't want to get <laughs> fall into that right. trap, you know. Well, usually, your newest song is your best song. So. Yeah. Cool, cool, guys. So, guys, when you're not writing, rehearsing, recording, uh, what do you guys do for a day off? What do you guys enjoy for fun, Tom? What do I enjoy? Yes. <laughs> On a day off. 
What I enjoy? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I like the warm weather. So, uh, and I'm an avid mountain biker. So that that's what I enjoy doing in my spare time. Cool. If that's what you're, if that's what you're asking about, yes, are you sir. asking about music? No, no, just yeah, in general, man. Yeah, that's a, that's a big, big um, source of entertainment for me. Cool, cool. What about you, Freddie? Uh, well, being that I, I freelance right, and I often have an MFA in theater, um, you know, I'm, I usually my plate is usually pretty full. I'm usually doing something, you know, whether it's like I developed uh, up here. You know, certainly my wife teaches at the college, so I live in Ithaca, New York. I developed a, a Christmas show this past December for local theater companies, and that was about a four-week process. But it's just as far as hobbies and stuff, you know, I mean, I like getting outside. You know, I'm definitely, you know, unfortunately, we, you know, most people complain about the snow, but this year I was a little disappointed that we didn't get more snow because I've been trying to go skiing every winter, you know, just lo just locally, like Creek Peak and Song Mountain and stuff. And, um, you know, they might have had some men, but I, I never got around to doing anything because it just was unseasonably warm. You yeah. know, it didn't really seem like skiing weather, so I just didn't really even do anything about it. Cool. I went hiking once. We were supposed to be snowshoeing, but there wasn't enough snow on the ground for snowshoes, so it just turned into a hike. <laughs> <laughs> cool, guys. So, throughout your whole career, so what would you guys say is uh, your most memorable moment so far? Tom? Um, probably, um, playing with Doro, getting to open for the, uh, Scorpions in Germany, which is pretty awesome. Meeting Michael Schenker, which was, was one of my, uh, my mentors. Um, but, but playing, playing arenas, <laughs> that's my most memorable moment in music. Cool. Cool. Freddie? Um, yeah, I would say there's, there's two that definitely stand out. I would say headlining the limelight in New York City with Widowmaker, when I was playing with Widowmaker with Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister. Um, that was a big like, homecoming show, basically, after we'd been on tour. Um, and anybody that's ever played the limelight knows that how great it sounded. And so that, that was definitely one of uh, a standout. You know, it's kind of funny because I played the Sweden Rock Festival with D2 in front of like, you know, 30,000 people. But that, it, it, it was kind of a blur. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the line like it definitely stands out in my mind as a more uh, more of an achievement in, in a lot of ways. And then, you know, I spent about a, a year touring playing bass with Quiet Riot. So, I mean, which was I, there were moments where I was standing on stage just kind of pinching myself, you know, because. I was standing on stage with Kevin DeBrow and Frankie Benelli and Carlos Cavazzo. And the second concert that I ever went to as a kid was the Black Sabbath, was Black Sabbath on the Born Again tour with Quiet Riot opening up on the Mental Health tour. Oh. So it was kind of surreal to, to, to be on tour with those guys and, and play all those classic songs and, um, you know, just have that experience, you know, as a young 23-year-old or 24-year-old, however old I was at that time. It was just a really, really amazing experience, you know, uh, to grow as a musician. Very, very cool. Fire and and be, be in that environment, you know, be taken embraced in that environment, given that opportunity. So I would cool. say those are definitely highlights. Cool, very cool. Guys, let's take it the other way. Um, do you have any Spinal Tap moments you want to share with us? <laughs> Plenty. Uh, <laughs> I'll let Freddie start first. Pardon me. Um, yeah, I guess uh, so. D. Snyder was is you know is such a great front man. You know, everybody knows that you know, his energy level. You know, oh, it's through the roof. Exceeds, yeah, exceeds guys half his age. You know, even now he's just like a consummate front man. Um, so just imagine him when he's you know in his thirties. Um, but uh, he, so he used to do, you know, one of his things was, I don't remember which song it was. It, it might have been um, You Can't Stop Rock and Roll or something. But he used to do these fist pump accents, like with the opening, like, bum, 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 bum. And, 
you know, like kind of punching his fists out to the side. <laughs> One night, I got a little bit too close to him, and he accidentally <laughs> punched me in the side of the face. <laughs> <laughs> So luck, luck, you know, luck, I, you know, I saw stars, but luckily I was able to kind of keep going. And yeah. We had a good laugh. Like that. Yeah, he, he's a big guy too. <laughs> oh yeah, no, he's no doubt. But I'm not. <laughs> I'm a small guy. So. <laughs> How about you, Tom? It's probably why his fist hit me in the face because you know I'm like I came up to his shoulder, you know, man. <laughs> <head. laughs> oh, for me? Yes, sir. <clears throat> It would be um, uh, playing uh, in Germany in front of, I think it was like 36,000 people in the arena and trying to do a Ted Nugent move <laughs> at the end of one of the songs, holding my guitar up in the air and jumping up and down. I mean, jumping up at the last chord and coming down and losing my balance and running backwards and falling down on the stage in front of 36,000 people. <laughs> However, the lights cut out just as I fell down, but that that's pretty spinal fat. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, awesome. Guys, the next song I want to play, um, Death and Satisfaction, what can you guys tell us about the tune? Um, Death and Satisfaction uh, is definitely probably <clears throat> our most... Um, I hate to use the Z word, but I'm a zeppelin kind of tune, I think. It's just that riff has a real sort of, you know, Jimmy Page kind of vibe to it. And the bass tone that I got on that record, to me, always reminds me of, like, Presence era John Paul Jones or something on steroids. Um, we had our good friend Randy Pratt uh, play harmonica on it. And he, um, if it, I have to give him a, a shout out because if it wasn't for Randy, we probably never would have even done this record because he graciously uh, let us use his studio to cut basic tracks. And that's where we cut all the basic tracks for this record was at Electric Randy Land on Long Island, which is Randy's studio. And, yeah, uh, we, we really owe a lot to Randy. He, he uh, yeah. really helped us out. And he also actually bought, bought a little more of the Z, the Z word <laughs> that too, with that harmonica. Right. Yeah, no doubt. no doubt. Yeah, he's been a big supporter of, you know, this project for me and Tom. And um, he's, he's really, you know, made it possible for us to do it. So. And cool. he's a super great guy. Awesome. Super awesome guy. I don't know. For people that don't know Randy Pratt, he plays harp in Cactus, but he's also the bass player in a band called The Lizards. Which is an amazing band. Amazing. If you haven't checked them out, you should check them out. We, if you want to play them on your show or something, they have a new CD out as well called Reptilis Maximus. That's absolutely fantastic. It's cool. awesome. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. I'll check them out. Definitely. Thanks. <laughs> Listeners, check it out. Death and Satisfaction from American Mafia. We'll be right back with Tom and Freddie.
right, gang, we're back with Tom and Freddie from American Mafia. Guys, another killer tune. Uh, thanks for uh, again for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank yeah, you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Billy. We appreciate it. Oh, uh, guys. Um. So you guys, you, you know, you've been around the block. Um. Would you say? You, yeah, and 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 again, you're working on this new EP. Would you say the music has evolved from the previous stuff compared to the the new stuff you're working on? You know, the, the, the Hit Machine came out so good. I personally, I was a little intimidated to try and follow it up. However, uh, I'm feeling really, really good about the new stuff. But this five-song EP, I think, for me, uh, it's going to be better than Hit Machine. <laughs> so, how do you feel about it, Fred? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we're tapping into some really inspired material. You know, we're pretty much using uh, uh, well I was going to say we're using the same formula in terms of people and stuff and engineers and stuff but we've changed a few things up we did the drums in a different place than we did it last time and um, got a friend of our an engineer friend of ours helped us get drum sounds that we're really happy with I mean it's it's definitely a little bit more um, you know open sounding in terms of the quality of the way the drums sound right now. So I think you'll hear an evolution in what we're doing. Uh, in all honesty, some of the material um, is of the same group of songs that uh, I don't want to make these sound like they're leftovers from Hit Machine, but Tom and I have a lot of material, you know, aside from new stuff, you know, that we, but we have a lot of material that we've been mining for these records and, so the material on the EP is kind of, you know, from the same chunk of material that Hit Machine was from. So it's not dissimilar, you know. I mean, it's gonna you're going to be able to tell it's us because it's me, Tom, and Bobby. The only difference is going to be on the EP. It's just going to be Don on vocals, you know. So um, and there won't be there won't be keyboards. Yeah, we're just keeping it a four piece for this. Oh, cool, uh, cool. So, yeah, uh, not the. Boards were stand out on on Hit Machine, but they were there, so they won't be there on the on the new album. Cool, very cool. Well, I mean, part of the reason for that is just a little bit of logistics. It's just you know, as we look towards you know maybe playing live and and you know working more together. Um, you know, it's easier to four piece. Yeah, like I was saying about the video, Tom, Don, and Bobby and I got along so well that it just seemed to make sense to move. Not not further complicate things by trying to add a fifth person. Right. You know, at this point, you know, maybe down the road it'll it'll make sense to do something like that. But right now, it's just easier to figure things out around four people schedules rather than five. You know, so. Right. Right. But uh, yeah, but to answer your question, you know, I I think I, I'm hoping you know you'll hear an evolution. You know, in terms of just the fact that. Simply the yeah, that would be, that we, we all know each other a little bit better, and so there's a little bit of um, that intuitive vibe, you know, and how we play together that is, you know, being cultivated. Right. Mike DeBeo played keyboards on Hit Machine. He did an amazing job. And uh, we'd love to work with him, but he has other other things going on as well. So it's it's simpler for us as a four-piece for now like Freddie said, but we definitely evolve if, it's, if it lent, lent itself available to us. Cool, cool, guys. So are you guys actively searching for a label or is just something just not in the cards yet? Well, Hit Machine is out on Grooveyard Records. Um, they're a small label based out of Rochester, New York. Um and, and, you know, Joe Romagnola, who runs that label, I, I should give him credit because, where credit's due because uh, Grooveyard came along at a time when, you know, to be you know, to, to be completely blunt, you know, I was pretty, pretty tapped out financially. So, you know, they kind of, you know, came in at the 11th hour and gave it, you know, a financial push that it needed to get mixed and mastered and, and out the door, um, you know, so... Um, you know, eternally grateful for that. Um, you know, but Grooveyard is, is 
you know, they don't have a ton of resources, so there's only so much they can do. Um, and now with the EP, we're kind of in a gray area because Groove Yard doesn't do EPs. You know, he only does full length. So, um, you know, we have to see. Yeah, I mean, so where this EP ends up, we're going to have to remain to be seen. That, that is an open question right now, whether we release it on our own, you know, in the hopes of, you know, generating some interest to do another full length. Uh, or, you know, a label comes along that's willing to put out the EP and, you know, use that as a as a, a getting to know each other period and then maybe, you know, do a full length with another label, you know, who, who, who decides to, you know, take a shot on us with the EP and put that out first as a teaser or something like that. You know, so we'll see. I mean, it's kind of an open door right now. Well, we don't have anything to shop at the moment except for the first the first CD the machine. And it's a year old already, so it's already, nobody wants to, anybody who hasn't heard it, who does uh, reviews, doesn't want to hear it because it's a year old, just for that reason, so. Oh, right, right. It's, uh, you know, Aside from that, you know, yeah. we, we don't have anything to shop until the, until the EP is done, and then we will. Well, yeah, Bill, you must know, I mean, people people tend to want to review a record either before it comes out or right when it comes out. Exactly. They want to review it. A year and a half later. Right, you know, right, you? right. You know, and I was just going to say, um, uh, with the, the the internet these days, you know, I always talk about this with the bands. Uh, it, it seems like um, you, you got that first six months when you release a new new uh, project or a new uh, CD. You got that first six months to make something happen. And uh, if, you know... It, it just kind right, of because is, music business relies on numbers, so you know, like all, all the people, like uh, in promotion and in management, are like, well, what kind of numbers did they do? <laughs> like we didn't do, we didn't do any numbers because we put it out on our own on a, on an indie label, mm-hmm. and you know, how many people have heard it? I don't know. You know, right. certainly not not a million, not one million. You know, right? And then you, you got a billion people on it. It almost doesn't matter if it's good or not. It matters more how many likes you have on Facebook. Uh, you know, exactly. <laughs> you know, and then there's 10,000 other bands in the world doing the same thing. Yep. Yeah, so, social media helps a lot. But the thing is, is, is like Freddie said, nobody wants to hear it if it's a year old already. So if the EP takes off or, or whatever we do after the EP, it it would lend, it, lend itself um, uh, the option to revisit uh Hit machine because, like I said, not many people have heard it. Right, right. You know? Like, uh, uh, if, if 10,000 10, people heard it, I'd be surprised. You know, that would be, you know, unbelievable to me. You know, so, you know, that, that's where it's at. Cool, cool, guys. So, um, we, we hope in the future a million people will hear it. Yeah, like a re release or something, right? Yes, yes, yeah, sure. So, or just people discovering it from from new stuff that they that they hear and, and you know, I don't know. You know how it works, right? Yeah. No. No. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, the industry sucks. <laughs> if you're not the flavor of the month, Justin Bieber or you know Miley Cyrus, then they they, they, they don't want to know you. No. Yeah, but you know, music is timeless. So if it's good, it'll it'll be good. For a long time. Exactly. <laughs> so you know, it's just a matter of people recognizing it, hearing it. And and to the Hopefully, credit... Brings, yeah, right. And to the credit of like, hard rock and metal, that's why they'll ne- they'll never go away. They'll never... It'll never nope. go away because of guys like you and the, you know, the people that listen to you guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate that compliment. What would you guys say is the ultimate goal for the band? What would you like to see happen? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Go ahead. I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. You know what I'm going to say. Well, I, you know, I mean, talking about a dedicated fan base for this kind of music, I mean, I, I feel like uh, our ability to sustain this relies on having some success in Europe, you know, and going over there and playing the festivals over there that happen every summer. You know, I mean, in an ideal world, 
you know, I don't have to sell millions and millions of records, but I think this music would appeal to enough people to at least warrant, you know, playing some festivals. Band -aids. You know, getting out, getting out to, to, you know, countries where, you know, rock is not a flavor of the month, but, you know, people are kind of dedicated to it, you know, for, you know, uh, their entire lives, you know, right. so... And the American audience can be kind of fickle in that way, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, I'm not saying anything new. I mean, it's, you know, people talk about it all the time, how devoted European audiences are to hard rock and heavy metal. So, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, in an ideal world, um, well, in a, in a really ideal world, we'd sell millions of records, you know, but uh, that's <laughs> what I was talking about. Right? <laughs> you know, but, but short, Short of that, you know, you know, I settle for just you know going to Europe and playing some festivals and you know doing that kind of circuit. Cool. What about you, Tom? No, I feel the same way. I think uh, I think we have a better shot at, at um, building a, a, a fan base. Well, however, there is social media now, so you, you never know. But um, I agree with Freddie. I think I think uh, the European market might be a, a good good home for us. Not that there's not a lot of people in the United States that would love this stuff, but it's just a matter of them hearing it. So it right. might be a good uh, starting point for us, you know. Right, right. Do a couple, you know, if, if we had the opportunity to do a festival in Europe, you know, I don't know if we'd have an opportunity to do that here, you know, being unknown. But, um, you know, it might be a good uh, starting point for us. Right, right. So, what advice would you have for the young guns out there, the the guys just starting out, Tom? Stick with it. You know, if you, if you really, if it's coming from your heart, you, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't just, uh, you got to stick with it. That's what there's to it. You know, if you have have some ability, you know, you can if you can write or play. Um, I have a client right now whose son is playing with uh, In Living Color. He's 19 years old, guitar player. I'm, I'm blown away. He's playing with uh, all these heavy hitters, you know. Um, and um, you know that that's a that's a great uh, a great thing for a young a young player to see. You know, somebody who's not. I see on on on, on the internet. I see all these young players who are phenomenal. You know. Um, so apparently this this young man hooked up with a great gig. So he's 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 set. So if you have if you have the abilities, just stick with it. You know? There's always an opportunity. Cool, cool. What about you, Freddie? Uh, yeah, just you know, work work hard. You know, take it seriously. Don't um, don't work hard. Hard work. You know, if you really put your nose to the grindstone, um, you know. Uh, eventually, you know, hopefully it would pay off. I think, you know, it's not something. If you're gonna, if you're gonna just kind of dabble in it, then you know, then just treat it as a hobby because there is a commitment there that's required to get to that next level. You know, and and there's no guarantee. You know, so um, just make sure you, you know, that it, you you really love what you're doing and you're willing to make the sacrifices that are necessary to. Um, you know, create a career, you know, in this field because it's not something that you can do without really sacrificing other things. You know, I mean, it really requires that much dedication. Right, right. Um, so, you know, just be sure that that's, that you're up for that. You know, right. It's, it's like now you have, have you have to have something to fall back. You certainly have to have something to fall back mm -hmm. on. I have a lot of friends who are musicians that don't have anything to fall back on. So they regret it. So, you know, stick with it, but have something to fall back on. You know, because again, there's, there's always, an, there's always a possibility of an opportunity, but there's nothing guaranteed. So great advice. Yeah, I mean, like I, I, you know, after I played with Widowmaker and Quiet Riot, I went back to school. I went back to college because, I, you know, I, for me, I just felt like, um, I, I had a couple of other offers to audition for bands, you know, that were, you know, of that ilk, you know, and, um, 
you know, I just felt like I had played with Dee Snyder and I played with Quiet Riot, and they were the biggest fans of that era. And I could certainly continue down that path of being a higher gun, you know, for somebody else's music. But I was, me personally, I was more interested in, I came to the realization that I was more interested in pursuing my own creativity. Um, you know, whether it be as a songwriter or, you know, as a writer or as a theater practitioner or whatever it is, I was interested in developing my own work. So, you know, that's kind of what made me go back to school. And, uh, you know, so now the joke that I have with everybody now is that if my music career doesn't work out, I have theater to fall back on. Which is, uh, just, it's, it's just as secure as a career. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but, you know, the reality is that... Um, you know, it's kind of been a winding path for me, but, um, you know, I'm not dissatisfied with that path because I've, you know, really gotten to try to figure out what my voice is artistically right. rather than just supporting somebody else's voice, you know. So and it's, it hasn't been an easy road, you know. I mean, who knows, you know, had I, had I stayed on the other path, you know, maybe I'd be uh, further along as a working bass player, but um, I might not be further along as as an artist. Right. You know? So there's always a sacrifice somewhere. You know, you just have to hopefully, you know, choose choose, <laughs> you know, make the sacrifices you can live with. You know. Yeah. Freddie and I both both chose to do our own thing. So you know, we both had the opportunity to to step out from the one touring band and go to the next and then get into that groove, you know? And uh, as, like Freddie said, for me personally, I had a great time, had a lot of fun, but, you know, I had to do my own thing. So, you know, yeah. have, having something to fall back on, you know, some kind of skill to fall back on is, is, is key if you want to do your own thing, so. Cool, cool, guys. Very, very, very good advice. Um, you know, I usually ask about upcoming shows. We talked a little bit about this. Uh, there's nothing going on now, but uh, future shows, something in the future. I mean, this is something you, you guys like to see happen? Yes, definitely. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, right now we're concentrating on finishing the EP, but, you know, as soon as we're done, and it doesn't have to be completely done, you know, I mean, as soon as we're done tracking, you know, and we send it off to be mixed and mastered, you know, we'll start to look at doing some gigs because, you know, like you were talking about labels and stuff like that, you know, if anybody, number one, if anybody is going to be interested in the band, they're going to want to see the band play and they're going to want to see that we're playing out. And number two, you know, my past experiences with other bands, you know, with social media and stuff like that, um, you know, well, playing live usually helps the social media numbers because people, you know, you, you get out in front of people that, might not normally come across you um, on a Facebook page. Um, but, uh, you you know, there's also... I actually lost my train of thought. <laughs> At a point, I was going to make... Well, I mean, yeah. it's... It, if you if you if you get some decent gigs, Fred, like we were saying, you know, not not the local bar, but if we could play like a festival or something like that, that that would greatly help, you know, promote the band. But um, we definitely have the thought in our mind that we will be doing some shows in the future, hopefully in the near future. But this, the EP is, is is the main thing that we're going to be pushing. That's that's our plug, the EP, and I'm. I'm not sure if we have a definitive name for it, but I, I, I think we might be thinking of Lead the Way for the title of the EP. So. Oh, cool, cool. Title one of the signs. Oh, yeah, I know what I was going to say. Um, you know, with record sales, you know, that's the whole, whole other part of this equation is that, you know, doing original music, you know, there was just something I saw on Facebook today that the number one record uh, on Billboard, I think, I guess right now, sold 17,000 copies. Yeah. Like, you know, it's just, it's just ludicrous that, you know, that a, a record that only sold 17,000 copies is number one. You know, I mean, you used to take millions of record sales to do that, you know, but so, you know, the music industry, everybody talks about how off balance it is in terms of record sales. Nobody buys records anymore and stuff. And that's true, but I think what it's done 
that's sort of a little bit of a positive to take out of it is that it has put more emphasis back on live performance. Um, because I think that went away for a little while, you know, and I, and going back to the early 80s when MTV came around, you know, there was the whole, you know, decade or so of MTV videos and stuff where, you know, live shows started to sort of become less important, you know, or less mysterious because you had access to it, you know, on MTV and then, you know, with the internet and whatnot. But so I think now at least there's a bit more emphasis on performing live because, Certainly for established bands, it's one of the ways that they can still generate an income because they're certainly not doing it through record sales. Right. So, um, you know, hope, hopefully hopefully the whole, you know, system will somehow come back into some sort of balance at some point. You know, but right now the emphasis seems to be back on live shows versus record sales. Right, I guess right. that's, you know. Awesome. Guys, where can the listeners find American Mafia? Uh, the record, they can get it on iTunes. They can get it at Amazon.com. They can get it at CD Baby. And they can get it at the uh, off of the Groove Yard Records website. Awesome, awesome, guys. And right. You can find out about the band by going to AmericanMafiaBand.com. And then all your... Links to uh, Facebook and whatnot are there, right? Uh, yes, they are. Yeah, it's um, the Facebook link is facebook dot com backslash American Mafia Band. American Mafia was already taken by you know people that historians. Right. <laughs> yeah. so, so everything with us is American Mafia Band. All right. Good enough, guys. Um, Guys, last tune I want to play tonight, uh, Friendly Fire. What can you tell us about the song? Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's probably one of the heaviest songs on the album. And um, it uh, it's probably it's probably my favorite song on the album, personally. Uh, Don did an amazing job on the vocal. Um, and... Uh, what else can I say, Fred? Everybody did an amazing job on it. The, the whole album, in general, like we said before, just uh, Freddie was talking about other aspects that just fell into place. Everything just fell into place. So it's, uh, you know, it's meant to be, I guess. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, Tom, Freddie, I want to thank you guys for uh, calling in tonight and chatting with us, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much you for good. having. Me. Yeah, thanks, Billy. We appreciate the uh, the support. Awesome. It's, you know, it's guys like you that enable indie bands like us to exist. So, you know, that is not lost on us, and we appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. you guys, yeah. hang out one second. Listeners, check it out. Friendly Fire from American Mafia. We'll be right back. Yeah. 